I just wanted to kind of introduce myself. I know some of the, the names um, of people who are in this webinar, but others are new. So just shortly, uh, quickly about myself, I'm Meredith Wong. I've been at Caring Kind for almost four years. Um, I actually um, have built much of what Connected Culture is today, and I can talk about Connected Culture um, in a minute. Um, but a little bit about myself, I actually have um, 15 plus years of experience in working in um, specifically art museums and accessibility, working uh, to develop um, adult access programs, and that's uh, access and accessibility is the term that cultural organizations use uh, to describe programs for people with different abilities or, or different disabilities. Um, so that covers um, people with hearing and visual impairments, people with learning disabilities, and in the museum world, sorry, in the museum world, um, the uh, people with dementia and the caregivers are included under that umbrella. Uh, so you might hear that terminology um, as you kind of learn about these programs. Um, so as I said, I've been working at Caring Kind for almost four years to build Connect to Culture. Um, I come from the art museum. Uh, world. So I came kind of with my whole network of museum colleagues um, and started to do trainings and education for um, for people who were working in museums to start with. Um, and it was basically uh, building awareness about the needs of people with dementia uh, and eventually also the needs of people who are the caregivers. Um, and building awareness about the, the actual disease, what the disease might look like in someone walking through your doors. Um, so it's really kind of a holistic view on, um, on getting everyone on the same page about this disease and about the needs of people who are experiencing it, uh, whether you be a caregiver or someone with dementia. Um, so that's basically a little bit about myself. Um, Connect to Culture is a program that was started, I believe, a year or two before I got to Connect to, to Culture. Um, it started out as basically a training program uh, for people who were working in cultural organizations. Um, I believe one of our uh, first cultural partners was Lincoln Center, um, and they continue to be a cultural partner. Um, some of you might have been to their Lincoln Center Moments program. Um, I should also say that while I'm doing training and education for cultural organizations, I also um, talk with families like yourselves um, about what types of programs are out there. Uh, and I'm talking specifically about the five boroughs. Um, right now I have uh, cultural partners in three of the five boroughs and I'm working on <laughs> getting, getting my first in Staten Island in the Bronx. Um, so right now, it's uh, the most robust um, collection of programs are in Manhattan uh, because that's mainly because uh, MoMA many, many years ago did a whole research project and created Meet Me at MoMA, which is still going strong. Um, and so the educators who were working in that and who were trained as part of that program um, then took their training to the other um, cultural institutions that they were working with. Um, so now it's actually grown beyond art museums. Um, it, um, beyond art museums, it's in um, history museums. Uh, it's starting to be in historic homes, although that has its own set of um, uh, challenging issues. Um, it's now part of the performing arts organizations like Lincoln Center, like Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, which is one of our uh, cultural partners. I'm starting to work and talk with um, dance companies, dance uh, individual teaching artists. Um, so this is all, um, it's all been a work in progress. Um, and I'm, because I'm, I'm a New Yorker, um, I've worked mainly with museums. And then a few years ago decided, well, why don't, why limit these programs to museums? Why not talk to botanical gardens uh, like Brooklyn Botanical Garden or Orpheus or Lincoln Center or um, kind of independent theater companies who have are, uh, also started to learn about um, these types of programs and learn about this audi these audiences like you and the person you're caring for. Um, so that's really kind of what Connected Culture is. Um, 
you might already know what caring kind is and who caring kind is. Um, just kind of very briefly, uh, we support caregivers of people with Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and we do that through our programs and services, um, things like support groups. Um, we have a helpline um, that you can call uh, and talk to someone about specific issues or kind of your, or if you're just overwhelmed and you need to speak with someone. Um, we have a wander safety program that I can talk to you about later um, and many other resources. Um, and most of those resources are free of charge for caregivers. Um, but I didn't want to go too much into this uh, because I wanted to talk about um, why connect to culture exists. Um, and I've, I've spoken somewhat about it um, and why I see the value in these types of programs and why my colleagues who are also in accessibility uh, and culture see the value in it. Um, so in a, um, typically in a museum, let's say, and this, the format of a program, um, at, at its core is very similar, whether it be in a uh, botanical garden or in a museum gallery or, um, or at a performing arts um, program. Um, but before I get into the nitty gritty of, of what a program might look like, um, really the value of these programs is about bringing together people who may not, one, have had opportunities or felt comfortable going to a museum or to a performance um, and also to to create a space a, an emotional space as well as a physical space where they know that the people who are facilitating that program have an understanding of what their needs are um, of course this is this may vary from family to family um, but really at, at its essence it's um, the, the value is creating these opportunities for families to come together and share experiences outside of the clinical, outside of your, your daily kind of um, caregiving routine um, or caregiver challenges. It's a space where you and the person you're, you're caring for can come and have, um, have an experience together. Um, and since these programs have been around for many years now, um, I have heard repeatedly from different caregivers in different um, in in different contexts, uh, either in a museum or in a um, <clears throat> or at the botanical gardens, that they they are constantly surprised at the level of engagement that the person that they're caring for has. Um, so there are levels of engagement, of course, at home. You know, some people know. Um, maybe you're listening to music that the person uh, you're caring for uh, enjoyed or enjoys. Um, and there is a connection that can be made through that. Um, looking at photographs, um, taking a walk around the park, uh, maybe that's nearby or around the, the, the city block. Um, so whatever that may be, that level of engagement is really um, the primary goal that cultural organizations want to, to capitalize on. And capitalize on meaning um, using whatever that collection or whatever that source material is, whether it be um, a sensory garden or um, hearing different instruments in an orchestra um, or walking through an immersive experience like the Intrepid, um, using that source material to um, start conversation if that's an ability that uh, that dyad has, um, or just to enjoy it together. There is nothing clinical about these programs, there, it's, and it's very purposefully non-clinical. Um, the idea is that we're creating this 75 or 90 minute experience for you to just enjoy each other's company and to enjoy the company of other people who, who are going through similar experiences as you. Um, so that's basically why these programs are around and why we encourage people, either caregivers on their own, and I can talk a little bit about that in a minute, or the caregiver together with the person they're caring for, to go and, and enjoy these experiences together. Um, 
there is a certain level of understanding, kind of innate understanding within a program for people with dementia and their caregivers that you wouldn't necessarily get in a kind of a, a general adult tour um, because you don't know who will who will show up for a general adult tour. These programs are specifically um, created for and capitalizing on the abilities that still exist for someone with dementia and their caregiver. So going into it, you know that when you register for one of these programs, you have that as kind of a, a baseline um, to know that the other people in, in these programs have or will go through similar experiences that you have gone through. Um, so the other thing is beyond it being kind of emotionally and, um, and mentally stimulating and socially stimulating, um, it may be that that cultural institution is introducing themselves to you for the first time. Uh, maybe you haven't had a chance to go to a concert. Um, um, and maybe I think a lot of the times families um, may be embarrassed or maybe ashamed to go to a cultural event with the person they're caring for because they're um, it's an, it, it's an unpredictable disease and it's the behaviors and the responses are unpredictable. The idea is that the people who are facilitating these programs know that they understand that responses to uh, works of art or to um, certain scents that um, that there will be unpredictable responses. And so with that understanding, they will say, if you need to step away, that's okay, but please do join us again. Because we want, we, we want caregivers to understand that there's, there is no need to be ashamed while you're in that program. There is an understanding that if you need to do what you need to do to either um, preempt uh, preempt um, kind of a frustrated behavior, or if that person is uh, needs to kind of step away and look at another work of art, that's okay. That's perfectly fine. And actually, sometimes we expect it because it, it might be hard to um, to sit for ten or fifteen minutes in front of one work of art. Um, so that's the idea of creating this particular environment. Um, so all of the people who I have had in my trainings, and, and this is not just the program facilitator, it's the people who sit at the front desk or at the admissions desk. It's the people in the retail, um, the retail store. Sometimes it includes, uh, security staff. Um, so there is that kind of common baseline understanding of these. This is a group of people who have these kind of um, um, have these characteristics, and there's no need to be alarmed if someone steps away. Uh, we have structures in place to support uh, to, to support everyone in that group. Um, so that's basically kind of why we have these programs in the first place. What a program might look like, um, again, is the, the basic structure is very similar, whether it's in um, at Lincoln Center or at the Intrepid or in a botanical garden. Um, what basically happens is that it's, it is likely kind of a 90 minute program. The first 40, 45 minutes might be um, time in the gallery. You'll spend maybe five or 10 minutes in front of a work of art or you will um, take a walk from the front gate of the botanical garden, making a couple of stops along the way to just enjoy being outside, enjoy um, visually and, um, and kind of the sounds that are unique to a botanical garden. Um, and then you'll kind of have conversations that are based on whatever that source material is. So in an art museum, that might look like, um, let's all gather around this one work of art. Maybe it's a, uh, a sculpture or maybe it's um, a painting. It may be abstract. It may be representational, like uh, a landscape. Um, and so while that, while that educator is, might be talking to you about um, the artist's name, <clears throat> maybe where that artist was from, 
the, the, the idea behind this particular type of conversation is less about learning and teaching the, the facts and the figures of that work of art. And it's more about, let's take a look at this work of art together. And so the, the, the educator will give you, give that group of people some time to just look at that work of art. A lot of times in a museum, there's so much to see and there's so much stimulation that the, the, um, the instinct is to kind of rush past. So this is a really, really a time for families to spend time together and to spend time in front of one work of art for six, seven, eight minutes. Um, so when you've sat in front of that work of art and you've had a chance to look at it, it is really interesting and surprising what you notice about a work of art, um, given the time to really soak it in. Um, and from that point, it's, well, what do we see in this work of art? Or how does this, um, if you're in a botanical garden, how does this herb, um, what does this remind you of? Or um, smell this herb and then tell me what it makes you, what it makes you feel. Now, these questions are very kind of general, uh, but the idea is that we want to use either that work of art or that herb to start the conversation. So someone might um, uh, might look at a, a landscape painting and say, that looks like where I grew up. And then you can take that car that bit of information and say, tell us, tell us about where you grew up or tell us about what about that painting reminds you of where you grew up. Um, so it's 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 a kind of a jumping off point for people. It may be the caregiver who is who is responding to it, or it may be the person with dementia. It may be verbal. It may be nonverbal. In all of these cases, it's considered a success if you are able to to make that connection and help that per, help help the people in your group make that connection. Um, it may be. Um, as simple as eye contact, it may be a smile, it may be a frown. Um, there is no right or wrong response to a work of art or to um, hearing or, or listening to um, a piece of music. Um, it may be an unfamiliar piece of music, but there's something about the melody, there's something about the tone that instigates some sort of um, response whatever that response may be. And um, museum educators and or um, trained docents will pick up on that and try to, to use that response as a way to engage further. Um, so anyway, so the, the first part of the program, usually about 40, 45 minutes, will be spent in the galleries or in the, um, a taking a law, a taking a walk along the botanic gardens, um, listening to music, um, watching a dance performance, and then the second half of the program. That's kind of where the variation comes in. So you might have, um, like at Lincoln Center, you might have um, a workshop format. So you'll either be, depending on what your abilities are, you might have art making, you might have music making. Um, and it was all, this will all be connected to whatever the discipline is. So if you're, um, if you've just had a performance by um, the chamber orchestra at Lincoln Center, the music making or the theme of that particular performance will inform what you do in those workshops. Um, sometimes there will be spontaneous dancing or movement. Um, sometimes there will be an art making session that is based on whatever the theme of, of that music is. Or maybe it's it's based on the period when that piece of music was written or the, the, um, the intentions or the perceived intentions of that piece of music. So it's always going to be connected to the first part of the program. There's always going to be that con continuous connection. Um, so, that that might be for performing arts um, program in a museum. It, it might also be an art making. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't have art making afterwards, again, based on um, the first part of that program. So if it's a 
if you've taken a tour through galleries on Renoir or Picasso or a contemporary artist, um, it's going to be based on whatever the themes were that were discussed in, in that first part of the program. Um, it's also going to be informed by uh, the participants, participants experience. So it may not be directly connected to um, what we learned in the gallery. It will be connected to what are your experiences of um, walking through a field of flowers? What are your experiences of um, spending time with family around a table? It's, it, it, there is no expectation that you will remember the facts and the figures of that work of art. The expectation is that uh, we use and we capitalize on your personal experiences um, of, that, uh, of those discussions. Again, if, if there is no recollection of what was talked about in, in the galleries, that's okay too. Um, you can the the facilitators will present um, the whatever the project is in that art making um, experience as a new experience. Um, here are the materials before you. Use those to uh, create a collage, create a painting, create a drawing, whatever it may be um, that tells us a story about X, Y, and Z. So. Um, Whatever that, whatever the response is to those, um, to that project is considered a successful response. There is no right or wrong response. Um, so I, I see I've, I've been doing a little bit of talking. Um, we've got about five minutes. Um, I want to, uh, I see there's some, there are already some questions in the chat. Um, let's see, I'm going to, I'm going to turn to the chat window and see if I can answer some of these questions. Um, hold on one minute. I'm going to make my, let me see if I can make my window larger. Oops, let's close this. Sorry. Um, if you do have other questions, feel free to, to type it in, in the chat room. Um, if you're on video and you want to just tell me through the mic, I can, um, I can undo your mic. Uh, so I have one question that says, I've noticed that Group Muse has moved to a virtual platform for chamber music during this pandemic, as they are normally concerts and in individuals' apartments in NYC. Perhaps they would offer these concerts to our population. Um, that's actually a, a great question. Um, and I can kind of answer that. I'm actually not uh, familiar with Group Muse, but there are other um, organizations who um, when in normal circumstances are able to visit people in their own homes um, to do basically a private concert. Um, there are musicians and I've seen this um, increasingly online, there are musicians who want to maintain their kind of um, their uh, performance skills. So they will do either a video or a live stream of um, a, a piece of music. Um, so this is basically what musicians are doing nowadays to kind of keep up the momentum of performing. Um, I would love to get some of those musicians to do kind of a live stream. Um, one of our uh, cultural partners is the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. Um, they're an orchestra that travels internationally. Um, and um, they, uh, before all of this happened, they were going out into the community to senior centers and residences and, um, and bringing music into these facilities where they might not have, uh, th those facilities might not have had a chance to have live music brought into their, into their spaces. So um, now I think mu uh, music organizations are trying to figure that out, one being live streaming. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I also see, uh, okay, so Grace asks, um, is it possible to come to Caring Kind and facilitate a workshop there? So um, that's something that I can talk to you one-on-one uh, -on -one about. Um, right now, I, my focus, and it's, it's basically just me who's doing Connect to Culture at the moment, um, I'm focused on going out to organizations across the five boroughs um, to 
help them create environments and also specific programs for people in their community. So people, so families who can't come into Manhattan or can't come into another borough because um, we all know that travel, um, traveling with someone with dementia can be its own challenge. Um, I want to make sure that communities in different uh, in the different boroughs have at least one or two programs within their community. So they're not having to travel long distances to have these experiences. Um, so with someone with an organization like Orpheus, they travel to all five boroughs. Um, right now they're not doing individuals homes, but they do do it in, uh, in partnership with different residences and senior centers. Um, I, I love to talk to people about um, opportunities for um, their being involved in supporting you as caregivers and supporting you as, as family units. Um, I had mentioned before that there, uh, there are actually two tracks that I'm, that I'm focusing on. One is for what we call the dyad, and that is uh, the caregiver together with the person with the disease. Um, another track that I actually is an, an initiative, um, a caregiver's only initiative. So while Caring Kind is um, exists to support you as a caregiver, um, Connected Culture is doing the same. So I've I've partnered with uh, the Alvin Ailey Dance Company, uh, the Intrepid, uh, the Rubin Museum down in downtown Manhattan um, to create caregiver only. Um, programs. So these are for caregivers, either you're a paid caregiver or you're a family caregiver. Both are welcome. Um, and these are this is time for you as caregivers to get together to meet each other uh, because that that social stimulation and connection is so important for you as a caregiver. Um, a lot of the times you are putting everything you're putting your life on hold to take care of the person um, in your care. I wanted to um, to encourage cultural institutions to create programs for you as caregivers to come together as a group, as a community, uh, to feel supported that way as well. Um, you may uh, be part of support groups, and support groups have their own um, their own goals and their own nuances of conversation. These programs are really meant to be. Um, ways that caregivers can connect outside of talking about um, their specific needs um, in their caregiving. Um, it, it may take the form of, uh, like at the Rubin, they will have um, a theme um, that they've decided on for a particular program. And then at the end of the 40 minutes in the galleries, they actually offer a free social tea in their in their beautiful cafe downstairs. And it's so heartening for me to be there to see caregivers connecting because at the end of the discussion in the galleries, there is a comfort level where by the time you get to the cafe, you're, you're feeling a little bit more comfortable to talk to pe these people who you might not have met otherwise. Um, so caregivers have exchanged information about um, uh, trials, clinical trials, or other cultural events that are going on. Um, they've exchanged contact information. So it's really, it's a, it's a very informal time for caregivers to really connect over light refreshments. And, and that's so important um, for both of these two tracks. Um, so I realize that it's now after 1.30, um, if you have any other questions, please do let me know. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, but if you um, if you have any questions about Connect to Culture, um, please uh, get in touch with me or get in touch with the helpline. Actually, I'm going to put the helpline number in the chat, and you can feel free to call them, and they can kind of direct you to any resources that you might need. Um, or they can direct you to me if you want to speak to me um, directly. Um, so just as a closing, um, this is the first of, I believe, six webinars that, I've, um, that I will offer on alternating Mondays starting today. The next one will be on April 20th at 1 o'clock, and that will actually be uh, a conversation with Joanne Daria at the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens 
Um, and she is, she will talk about her efforts to uh, engage caregivers while we're all confined to our homes. Other um, cultural partners who are involved um, are Arts and Minds, Lincoln Center, The Intrepid, and possibly MoMA later on in June. Um, so thank you so much for joining me. Um, this is wonderful. We've, we had uh, about 20 people um, and that's a terrific response. Again, if you have any questions, please uh, get in touch with our helpline and, um, and make use of, of that resource because we are here for you. So thank you very much and um, have a wonderful day um, and stay safe. Thank you.